The Tom Woods Show, episode 1854. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, Tom Woods here. Well, a lot of people are unhappy with Joe Biden, and I guess you could count me among them with the various things he's done in the short time he's been in office so far. And we have seen some movements in some states to push back against Washington, D.C. So we are returning to a theme that was more, let's say, front and center maybe 10 years ago when the idea of state nullification was really starting to pick up steam again after having been more or less abandoned for a long time. And of course, the usual suspects demonize the idea, but there's nothing wrong with it. And Thomas Jefferson believed in it, and it has extremely good constitutional and moral and historical arguments in its favor. The idea that the states have the power to refuse to enforce or to obstruct the enforcement of unconstitutional laws within their borders so they can stop unconstitutional federal laws. Jefferson thought that was absolutely essential. The states have this power. Now, you never heard that. Absolute guarantee in school, you never heard that about Thomas Jefferson. They might have given you a little something about John C. Calhoun, whom they then proceeded to demonize so that you would never look into any of his ideas. But Jefferson, well, people kind of like Thomas Jefferson, so they would just keep quiet about the fact that he agreed with this idea. So I did indeed write a book called Nullification back in 2010, and it's quite relevant even to this day. And if you like American history, and particularly American history that's been kept from you, you will enjoy my book, Nullification. I'll link to it on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1854. And you can get a free audiobook version of the book. If you have not signed up for Audible before, then part of their offer is you get a free audiobook. So you can do that at tomwoodsaudio.com. And then even if you cancel Audible and you never buy anything, you still get to keep that free audiobook. So tomwoodsaudio.com is how to grab that offer. So this is a talk I gave in North Carolina back in 2013. Now, whoever it was who introduced me, I, I remember this, it was the worst introduction I had ever gotten. He did not tell the audience a thing about who I was. And then he just invited me to come up on the stage. I couldn't believe it. So there may be in the opening moments of this, I haven't had the guts to go back and listen, but there may be an effort on my part to try to drop in there little hints of my credentials, just so people will know that I'm worth listening to, that I know a little something about what I'm talking about. So now that you're in the know on that, maybe you can listen in for those at the beginning as I'm trying to drop little bits and pieces of my biography in front of the audience so that they'll know who the heck I am. So anyway, I'm drawing from the archives for this one. This is a talk from, I guess, eight years ago now. So here we go and enjoy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. I'm always grateful to people who sacrifice an entire Saturday for an event like this. That's great. I mean, that is... That's fantastic. And I want to thank, of course, the North Carolina 10th Amendment Center and all the sponsoring organizations. And I was going to tell you, after this session is over, go out there and get to know people at these tables, but they've all packed them all up. So that just leaves my table, you can know. <laughs> I don't want to sway you in any way, but I, I do want to mention that if you've seen me on my phone, I'm, the person I've been texting with is my wife. I have to keep in contact with her. Her health is not super good, and she's um, expecting our fifth child, so she has these very hard questions. We have four children already, uh, ranging in age from three to ten. They're all girls. So I think you see what the odds are, what's going to happen to me in March. That's okay. That's okay. They're, they're wonderful, right? There's, so far, everything's been fine, so I can't anticipate there'd be any problems in the future. <laughs> what do I usually do when I speak at these things? I've spoken in a lot of these Nullify Now things, but you write a book called Nullification, well, you know, you get the invite in the mail. <laughs> now, I've had, uh, gosh, I guess I've written 11 books, and for a while, it was every time a baby would be born, I had a book coming out. <laughs> Then we, we couldn't keep up with my publishing pace, but I've slowed down, and yet now the baby production's going back up again, so who knows how it's all going to even out, ultimately. But I had a, a New York Times bestseller, two of them, but one of them was called The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. That's what I was Before that, 
that time, I was some guy who wrote books that other professors would read, and you know, if they would sell a hundred copies, they were considered an academic bestseller, and you know, little did the publisher know I bought 50 of them just to bump the numbers up. So for that book to really take off, it, was, it really sort of took me by surprise, and the nature of the attacks that I suffered, I'm telling you this not out of narcissism, but because there is a lesson here, the nature of the attacks was very revealing. Because I was not attacked for saying things that were wrong. I was attacked for saying things. <laughs> so for example, the book came out late 2004, and the New York Times in January the following year wrote not a review in the book review section, as you might expect, but a signed editorial on the editorial page about just how dangerous this book is. And they proceeded to list some of the claims that I made, none of which they refuted. Can you believe he says this? And he said that president didn't do any good, and this one was a bum, and, and, and he supports nullification? So in other words, they, they never said, and here's why he's wrong to say these things. It was crime enough that I had even raised these points. A peon like me isn't even entitled to a reputation. <laughs> so what do you suppose happened the week after I was attacked in the New York Times? How do you suppose my sales went? <laughs> So the second time I had a New York Times bestseller was 2009, a book called Meltdown, a free market look at the financial crisis. How do you think the New York Times handled that one? Ignored it completely. <laughs> oh, but that makes me happy. You know, every week they had to put it on the list, they're gritting their teeth. And now to imagine that, well, gosh, I mean, I, I could still be a sort of, I'm, I'm not a, my wife could still be of childbearing age and the New York Times could be out of business. Like, it's that close. To imagine that we're living at a time like this is amazing, right? It's a glorious moment to be alive, everybody. Many of our ancestors would have killed to live at a time like this. And it's our good fortune to be here. Well, now, it's not, it's not all happiness, though. It's not all collapsing New York Times and falling profitability for the Washington Post. It's not all good news. There's plenty of bad news as well. I mean, you already know that. I'm not going to bother you by by listing it, but I would say the classic example of this would be if we're looking back at 20th century and constitutional interpretation and the Supreme Court, what we'll find is that from about the 1940s down to the 1990s, the Supreme Court really couldn't seem to find much of anything unconstitutional. Oh, they scoured everything. They couldn't find anything unconstitutional. Then 1995 came along. And we had this case, United States versus Lopez, and this was about the Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990. And the argument that was being made here by the defendant was, this is an unconstitutional law. The federal government has no authority over establishing rules for guns near schools. And in fact, at the time that this, this law was passed in 1990, there were already such laws in 40 states. So it was superfluous for the federal government to be involved anyway. Well, here's how the government tried to defend itself in the, before the Supreme Court. They argued, no, 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 it is constitutional for the federal government to establish gun-free school zones. And here's why. The Constitution authorizes the federal government to regulate interstate commerce. Well, if kids are worried when they're studying that maybe there's a gun nearby, they won't be able to learn as effectively. And if they don't learn as effectively, they're going to be dumber. And if they're dumber, they're not going to be able to produce as much. And if they don't produce as much, then interstate commerce will be diminished. So that was too much even for the normally indulgent Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, you know, you know, we've really turned a blind eye to an awful lot in the 20th century, but that, that we just can't say. Like, that's too much. And so we got commentaries from a lot of conservatives who said, the counter-revolution is on, right? The Supreme Court struck down the Gun-Free School Zones Act of 19... This is it, man! Off we... Nope, that was pretty much it. <laughs> After that, they just carried on in their way. Like, that was it. But that type of reasoning... The federal government fully expected to win that case. Because they've been engaging in that type of reasoning all along. I mean, some of you know the Wickard versus Filbert case, 1942, right? 
people grow. Isn't that awesome? We have an educated group here that they hear Wicker versus Filmer. They, oh, what an example of jurisprudence. I love you people, right? Fantastic. But those of you who don't know, now you're afraid to say. Right? So I'll let you all this, and later you can joke about it. But that case involved a farmer, and he was consuming wheat that he that he had grown on his own property for his own consumption and for the consumption of his livestock. And the federal government said they were allowed to regulate that. He said, I, I really don't think so. I don't see how this could be interstate commerce. It never left my property. And part of their answer was, well, it, it is interstate commerce because the fact that you consumed your own wheat and thereby abstained from purchasing wheat in interstate commerce means that you influence interstate commerce. So in other words, merely it's just standing there and surviving affects interstate commerce. So I sometimes, you know, I, I start off telling you about my kids, not just to let you know what's going on in the Woods family, but also because I've sometimes wondered, along these grounds, I mean, couldn't they just as easily regulate human reproduction on the same lines? I mean, the more children you have, the more they're going to engage in interstate commerce. Whatever. So like, I feel like i got to tell my kids, don't produce anything. Right? And then, then maybe they... <laughs> So that's the situation that we're in. And then, you know, I open up this book, Nullification, recounting the Nancy Pelosi story about Obamacare, when they ask, you know, just, we're just kind of curious, is there anything you had in mind constitutionally when you did this? We just want to know. We're just curious. And you know her response was the laughter, and then are you serious? And then they move on to the next question. So the Constitution went from being like the foundation stone of the country to being like the butt of a joke. That's where it's gone. That's where we are. And that's why we're talking about something like nullification. So what I usually do at an event like this is I give the constitutional case, which is very strong, by the way. The constitutional case for nullification is very strong. I give a constitutional case. I respond to objections. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to take a different tack, partly because some of you people creep me out a little bit. You watch all my YouTubes, and you already know everything I'm going to say. You know, all my jokes and everything. And I, you know, I feel like a stand-up comic in the age of YouTube. What am I supposed to do? Probably new material every night? What is this? So I'm going to do something a little different. But if you want that stuff, well, okay, obviously I have this book and it costs a lot of money to raise five kids, so in case you feel like uh, buying one. Um, but I also have this stuff available online. So what one, the one sort of takeaway from today is I'm going to give you some website names to jot down with free stuff. If you're like me, you're a cheapskate and you like free stuff. Well, today is your lucky day, my friends. The first thing I'm going to refer you to is my frequently asked questions on nullification. Nullificationfaq.com. That stands for frequently asked questions. Nullificationfaq.com. And that deals in part with the, is it constitutional? What about the supremacy clause? And so on and on. And it also deals with common objections. My super-duper fundamental basic overview of nullification is at statenullification.com. Isn't that? These are easy to remember. <laughs> Nullificationfaq.com, statenullification.com. Okay. Now, having said that, what I want to do instead today is focus on this. What is it that makes the United States different from other countries in the world? Now, there are a lot of things you could cite. The United States very early on had a written constitution, for example. You could, you could find a lot of things that distinguish it. But what I want to point out in particular is that unlike France or Britain or many of the other countries in the world you might think of, the United States was not intended to be one giant blob. It was rather thought to be a collection of societies. That's what makes it different. So you'll notice in the Constitution, for example, that the United States is always referred to in the plural. What do you think they're trying to emphasize there? That what makes the United States great is not that it's a great big thing. When I used to be a college professor, I was so surprised at how many of my students thought that what made America awesome was that we're so big. <laughs> Canada's big. You know, Mexico is pretty big. The Soviet Union was huge. I don't want to live in the Soviet Union. China. China was not a fun place to live for much in the 20th century. It was as big as you could ask for. So there's obviously got to be more than that. No, it's not that. In fact, there are plenty of places in the, in the world that are very small, that are wonderful places to live. So it's not size. In fact, if anything, the larger the unit gets, the more dysfunctional it gets. No, what makes it different is that it's a collection of societies, each of which is supposed to be self-governing. That was the purpose of the American Revolution. No taxation without representation was merely a subset of the more general principle, 
leave us the heck alone in our domestic affairs. That was the principle of the revolution. Then we look at the whole history of the U.S. from the Declaration of Independence down through the Constitution. We see this principle repeated over and over again. The emphasis on the United States as being a plurality of things. It's not a single blob. It's a plurality of things. So the Declaration of Independence. Everybody focuses on the all men are created equal part. And then everybody forgets the grievances and the rest of it. But what they especially forget is that at the end, it, re it says that it refers to these states are declaring their independence, right? And, they, and that these states can do all the things that sovereign states may of right do. That these states are and ought to be independent states. Now, they did not say this giant blob is declaring its independence from the British. There was no such thing. There was no giant blob. It was a collection of societies. That year, 1776, was the year that the colonists decided, or at that point they were on the verge of uh, becoming independent, they were deciding on the laws pertaining to treason. And they decided that the laws pertaining to treason, or the crime of treason, would be perceived as being perpetrated not against a giant blob called the United States, but against the individual states themselves, because those are the constituent parts of the United States. We see the states exercising powers that belong to sovereignty very early on, even during the Revolution. Massachusetts and Connecticut and South Carolina all outfitted ships to cruise against the British. It was the troops of Connecticut that took Ticonderoga, and the executive of New Hampshire was authorized to issue letters of mark and reprisal. These are all powers that are attributes of sovereignty. Then when the Treaty of Paris establishes peace between Americans and the British, it does not say the British hereby acknowledge the independence of a giant blob. We are recognizing the independence of, and they list all the states. And if you look at various treaties that were entered into at that time with Sweden and with other countries, they all acknowledge the independent states. Then the Articles of Confederation that was written in in, in, in 1776 and then into 1777, sent out and then finally not fully approved until 1781. Articles of Confederation, Article 2 says that the states retain their sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Now, my dictionary indicates that if somebody retains something, they must have had it to begin with. So they must have had their sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Now you, and then we look at the ratification of the Constitution. Did we have a vote of one giant blob to decide whether or not to ratify the Constitution? No. We went to every single constituent society. Every single state had its say in whether or not it wanted to ratify the Constitution. Now, why do I say all this? The point of all this is twofold. One, to emphasize to you the uniqueness of the United States. It is so easy to talk about American exceptionalism and America's awesome and then to act as if the United States is actually no different from any other country. It is different in this very important way. And secondly, you'll see the connection between this and nullification. Because now we get to the, the question of sovereignty. Where does sovereignty reside in this system? Now, what is sovereignty? We say somebody or something is sovereign. If it can make a decision and its word is final, so a colony is not sovereign because the mother country can always intervene. But in the American case, where is sovereignty? Is sovereignty in the U.S. government? No. Is sovereignty in the state governments? No. The sovereignty is in the peoples of the states. The old world model of Europe that Americans left behind held that the king, good King Charles is our sovereign, or the government is the sovereign. But the American view is that no government is sovereign. So when we talk about state sovereignty, that's just shorthand. What we're talking about is the sovereignty of the peoples of the states. And again, notice I'm saying peoples of the states. I'm not saying the people. I'm not talking about one undifferentiated blob. I'm talking about the people of New Hampshire, the people of Virginia, the people of North Carolina. Those peoples are sovereign. And those sovereign peoples apportion their sovereign powers between state and federal governments. Now, given that the sovereignty resides there, given that in their sovereign capacity, these peoples voted to ratify the Constitution and create this federal government as their agent, it therefore follows as a matter of strict logic, 
apart from the constitutional arguments I could make, that these sovereigns, if sovereignty is to mean anything, retain the power in the last resort to prevent their own creation from destroying them. That's where nullification comes from. That there is no... So don't talk to me about, I believe in state sovereignty, but I don't believe in nullification. Then you don't understand the definition of words. <laughs> because if you are sovereign, then you do have the power in the last resort to say, no, you, my creation, cannot do that to me, your creator. That's what the sovereignty is all about. In his famous report of 1800, James Madison said that, I mean, in effect, we have courts, and they adjudicate disputes in the natural course of things, but when you have an extreme situation where all three branches have gone off the rails, I mean, I know this is a hypothetical situation, I realize that would never happen, but suppose that did happen, Madison says, in the last resort, it falls to the parties to the Constitution. Who are the parties to the Constitution? The peoples of the states. Okay, they have the sovereign power to say no. Now you may say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Woods. They lose that sovereign power when they join the federal government when they created the Constitution. But that is not the view of the international lawyers of the 18th century. Now when you hear international lawyers get worried, you think it's Boutros, Boutros Ghali coming back. But he had the best name of all the Secretary General, so I've just been using that ever since 1989 or whenever he, he left. But all that meant in the 18th century was just people who theorized about how nations ought to interact with each other, like what should be the rules pertaining to trade during wartime, questions, questions like that. And one of the best known international jurists of that time was a guy named Emmerich de Vittel, and he wrote a book in 1758, The Law of Nations. And he said that when you have a group of sovereignties that create a compact among themselves to establish, for example, like a federal government, to confederate, they are not giving up one ounce of their sovereignty. They're just as sovereign as they were before. They're saying that, okay, we voluntarily agree that we won't exercise the following powers. That doesn't mean they're less sovereign. It was by their own sovereign decision that they did that. And therefore, by their own sovereign decision, they can recall those powers. So that is the sort of mainstream view of the 18th century. Now, having said all this, I want to move to a somewhat delicate topic. Because if all I did was throw out red meat that you guys cheered, where would be the fun in that? Right? I, I, have to, I have to make you guys think a little bit. And I'm not here, I'm not trying to insult anybody. I have nothing but esteem for everybody in this room, because everybody in this room has defied the official 3 by 5 card of allowable opinion by coming here. Because, you know, there are two, two opinions you can have. You can, and they're all stupid, right? The, 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 the New York Times will say to us, you can debate whether or not the top marginal tax rate should be 40.1 or 39.5%. That's a debate the New York Times loses no sleep over. But if we say, well, wait a minute, should we have an income tax at all? <gasps> whoa, whoa, extremism, citizens, stick to the script. 39.5, 40.1, remember, that's what we're debating here. No extremism allowed. So nullification is not even on the New York Times radar screen, right? I mean, they don't, they don't even bother to refute you when you raise it. So you're here, and I appreciate that. But the gentle thing I want to, the gentle nudging I want to do involves the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, I understand, I got here a little late, but I understand people recited the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning. Now, at the very least, I must urge you to go silent at the words, one nation indivisible. That is an anti-American What you are pledging with those words is allegiance to France. That is the principle of the French Revolution. The French revolutionary leader Sieyès said, France is not a collection of states. She is a single whole. And everything is lost in the revolution when we concede France to be a collection of states. But you know what? The United States is a collection of states. And so, you know, friends don't let friends accidentally do something French. <laughs> I just want to point that out That's what makes the United States different and great We are a collection of societies A federation of country clubs is not itself a country club Well likewise what we are is a collection of societies That's how it was supposed to work I love that country club example it comes from my friend Don Livingston 
All right, now I want to also, um, he's a great retired professor in, uh, from Emory University, and I want to borrow a little bit of his, of his thinking because anytime you're talking about nullification, you are also implicitly raising the issue of the size, the proper size of the political unit, where decision-making should rest. Because the American view is that decision-making should be made at the local level, and then if it's something super-duper important, whatever that would be, at the state level, and then if the states are unable to handle it, then the federal government. It's a series of levels. But the thinking was, there's hardly anything that really needs to go above the state level. Like, very, very little in the view of the framers. So what we are basically saying is that at this local level is where most decisions ought to be made. So we are saying something about the proper size of the decision-making unit. And in taking that position, we are also running headlong into conventional opinion. Because conventional opinion has been taught that we don't even raise that question. But we've been taught that it's perfectly normal to have one city issuing irresistible, infallible judgments and decisions and orders to 310 million people. And we consider that to be normal. That's, the, that's normal. That's how things should be. But that, you know what? Maybe that's not normal. Maybe 310 million people being ruled over by one city. Now, I grant you, this city is full of public-spirited people who just want to pursue the common good. So perhaps I'm being cynical. <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's better for decision making to occur at a, at a lower level. But there's this prejudice we have in favor of large political units. Right? Everybody thinks that's the US is awesome because look at we're a great big place. That is not what makes us awesome, and that's not what's made some of the great civilizations uh, so good. I mean, look at look at the Renaissance city states, look at how small they were. Look at the extraordinary outpouring of culture in such a short period of time. Or look at tiny Athens in ancient Greece, which had a thousand political entities in it. And look at the outpouring of drama and philosophy, not to mention natural philosophy, which is what we would call the sciences today, and art and architecture that we're still imitating and learning from today. Moreover, the Greeks twice defeated the seemingly unstoppable Persian Empire, in spite of the fact that they were a collection of small societies. The city-state of Venice, flourished for 1,200 years before it was conquered by Napoleon. Switzerland maintained its independence in a hostile Europe for 700 years. What about large states giving us uh, security, right? At least they give us security. That's one thing we can say. But look at the 20th century. Was France a safe place to live in the 20th century? Was Britain a safe place to live in the 20th century? Was Germany? Was the Soviet Union? Was China? So in other words, for human excellence, human flourishing, and indeed even our safety, it is not necessary to have large political units. It's certainly not to have them monopolizing all the decision making. Or think about this. It is very likely that in this century the population of the United States will reach 435 million. How many representatives are in the House of Representatives? 435. That means each representative is going to be representing somehow one million people. What could representation possibly mean in that situation? Remember, the framers uh, toyed with the idea of saying that it should be no greater than 30,000 people per representative. One million. In our current situation, there would, be, there would have been about, if, if we took the current population and we calculated it and we went back in time to the original Congress, there would have been four congressmen in the original Congress. And today, if we use the 30,000 thing, we'd have 10,000 people in the House of Representatives. So maybe, maybe the thing is just too big. And certainly for this thing to be issuing infallible, irresistible commands, why is it just obvious that that's the best system? Why, like, why is it that anybody who questions that, there's something wrong with him? You know, why don't you just confine, go back to debating 39.5 versus 40.1? Stop asking all these fundamental questions. Seems to me if we keep bothering ourselves with these dumb distractions of, of the New York Times. That's what they want. They want us to be hamsters in a wheel. We never make any progress. We have to, we have to take a crowbar to that wheel, just start smashing that wheel, and then smashing the glass and water it off. All right, finally, I want to talk about a little stuff that I've been doing and stuff that you guys can do. 
And first of all, I'm just glad to be in a room with people who have been doing so much. Right? I mean, first of all, Mike Church is just one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah. And, and it is, to me, it is an outrage that Mike Church is not a household name. He's on, you guys should be listening to him, 6 to 9 a.m. on your drive on Sirius XM on the Patriot Channel. Listen to Mike. He makes three hours go by like it was 10 minutes. Right? Like, you don't even want to talk to him. But seriously, I mean, I, th this guy, I mean, this is a guy who, well, who sticks his neck out for us, taking unpopular positions that nobody else on the radio will take. Nobody else on the radio, on big time radio. It's only Mike. He's a lonely voice out there, and he's done an enormous amount for us. We should rally to him. Listen to him. You'll love it. It's not like a short, well, Wood says, I gotta listen to church, so I gotta, uh, yes, I'll do it. You're just gonna love it. The guy's, I listen to him when I have these early flights and I'm in the car, and he'll go an hour without a guest. He'll have a guest for, you know, for part of the hour, and then the other hour he'll just be talking. And he just talks for an hour, and it's all interesting. And I just think, my gosh, when I host the Peter Schiff show, I'm thinking, I have 20 minutes of the commercial, I don't know what to talk about. He's blah, 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 and it's great. <laughs> but this room is full of people like that. I mean, the, these tables were full of your neighbors who are out there doing things. Get to know these people. Well, one of the things I did, of course, you all know, so I wrote this book called Nullification, and the beauty of it is you can tell what nullification kind of is based on the fact that the word is stamped over the faces of Obama, Biden, Pelosi, and really all the faces. Woo! It's, it's like a whole, I don't know, like a whole collection of the mediocre right here, right here on the cover. So whatever the heck it is, you're probably favorite. But I did this uh, just because I was noticing that I, I've been writing about nullification, speaking about it as a historian. That's what historians do. We write about old things. I, I never thought I'd be writing about it as current events. Right? I was writing about the Virginia Kentucky resolutions of 1798, and I enjoyed doing that. And then I noticed there were these Tea Party groups that were posting my videos saying, hey, we ought to try that now. And I thought, I never thought I'd live to see people courageous enough to think that way. So I thought, all right, I'm going to write this because if you're going to try to advance these ideas, you are going to come up against a lot of, you're going to be called names, you're a racist, you probably support slavery. Yeah, that's, that's really generous, right? You just automatically assume you probably support slavery. Even though, as you heard today, these people are so dumb. You heard today that nullification was never used to support slavery. It was used to fight against slavery. So the, the argument doesn't even make sense. So I wanted to do this, and the thing is that I wanted to get some good, prominent people for blurbs on the back, but nobody wants to touch nullification with a 10-foot pole. So if I may just list for you the honor roll here, because they did stick their necks up, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Woo! And then Barry Goldwater Jr. and Walter Williams came up. national figure, like a national politician, that'd be great too. But I thought, I don't want to put Ron Paul on the spot because maybe he runs in 2012 and the whole campaign is, hey, you endorsed this crazy book by Woods. So I thought I better not touch him. And yet, repeatedly, the campaign, he calls for nullification. Like, I, I should have asked him. <laughs> but anyway, what's, what was fun about doing this is that I got to sort of tell U.S. history that... I certainly didn't learn in school. I had to learn it on my own. They certainly don't teach it in the law schools, that's for sure. But what I'm, okay, so I talked about real history that went on. The things that the states used to actually get away with. Or, and this is not a Southern doctrine per se, because I, I quote, I have a whole speech in here from, from a Connecticut governor in 1809 saying, I don't want anybody in our state in any way cooperating with this federal embargo that's been placed on us. It's an outrage, it's unconstitutional. And in the 2010 race for Attorney General in Connecticut, the Republican candidate during one of the debates held up my book and read from this governor and said, this governor spoke this way 200 years ago. Why don't we have the guts to do this today? The jaws all dropped to the floor. This woman has strayed from the three by five card. Attack, attack. Don't you know we're debating 39.5 versus 40.1? You can't ask that. Or here, one of my favorite moments when I was... Uh, getting my PhD, 
I was in uh, the stacks, the library stacks at Columbia, one of the most depressing places in the world. It's dark and dank and ugh. And I just happened to come across, and this is no, no kidding, a box, an old box uh, amidst the stacks. And I open up this box, and it's all old political pamphlets. And by old, I don't mean like 1971, I mean old. And I dug up this pamphlet by Abel Upshur, who was an important jurist of the 19th century, but totally forgotten. Of course, all the good guys are totally forgotten. They're either smeared or forgotten. And he has this fantastic pamphlet in defense of nullification. And I sat there reading it, and I, I couldn't believe this thing. So then I did a little research. Has this ever been reprinted? It was reprinted in a magazine in 1835, and then never appeared anywhere ever again. So I put it in here. <laughs> I mean, a guy who's written a book called Nullification has probably read a lot about the subject. That's the best piece I've ever read. And we've never even heard about it. I had to, I wasn't even looking for it. I didn't even know it existed. I, I mean, think of what's out there that we don't even know about. It's just collecting dust in a library somewhere. And I just found it. So, so now, and I've been waiting for years. What can I do with this thing? So I stuck in, I got a section on documents. Like, here's stuff that really happened. You don't have to take my word for it. This is real stuff. So I love this stuff. But as I say, this is not stuff that you'll learn in law school. In, the, in law schools, what you'll learn is the United States is a great big blog and always was and was always meant to be. And the United States came before the states. How that could be, I have no idea. There must be some non-Aristotelian logic they teach you in law schools where that would make sense. <laughs> Could the marriage come before the bride and groom? Like how, how? How? And in fact, just in case you, you, you were unconvinced of the total corruption of the law schools, and I, I realize I'm taking liberties with my time, but I started late. But the, but the corruption of the law schools, some of you know this story, but my old friend Kevin Goodsman, we wrote a book together called Who Killed the Constitution? Kevin has a PhD in history, but he also has a law degree, so he's got his foot in both camps. So Kevin was telling me about when he was studying for the bar exam, he said he took one of these crash courses, getting ready for the bar exam. And I've now had this confirmed by another person who took these crash courses for the bar exam. You are told that when you get to the multiple choice section, an important test taking tip is as follows. If you get to a question and one of the possible answers is the 10th amendment, that's always wrong. That's <laughs> never right. You can just cross that right out. Now Jefferson said, the Tenth Amendment is the cornerstone of the Constitution. It's gone from the cornerstone to being always the wrong answer. That's what they learn in law schools. And this is why when sometimes they'll put me up against a law professor to debate, and when I find out it's a law professor, I breathe, I breathe a sigh of relief. I know he's not going to know anything. <laughs> All right, so now what can we all do, right? So that's one, that's one thing I did. Uh, another thing, I, I just, just a few weeks ago, I started my own weekday podcast. Yeah. Anybody listening to it? <laughs> but actually, it zipped right up the charts on iTunes. I didn't even know iTunes had a chart. But under news and politics, right out of the gate, I hit number two. Number one is NPR. So, so please subscribe to my show on iTunes, but we also broadcast it at TomWoodsRadio.com Monday through Friday. And uh, I've been doing this, I guess I've been doing it for four weeks, I don't know where the time went, but it, that's been a lot of fun, that's something I can do, and I just offer that for you guys every day, okay, it's just free, listen to it, enjoy it, whatever. If you don't like it, you can just throw it away, you know, just to put it in your recycle bin and forget about it. But so that's something that I can feel like I did something every day, I'm doing a lot of long-term projects. And that discourages me at the end of the day. I go home and I feel like, well, I still haven't finished. But every day now I go home and say, I did this. I, did, I had this person on and I educated people on this subject and I learned something too. Because I don't know everything and I want to fill in gaps in my own knowledge. So I have experts on every subject under the sun. And it's fantastic and I can do it basically for almost nothing and, and just give it away for free. Who was the first guest I had on? You would think, oh, maybe he'll have Judge Napolitano or something. I said, you know, I'm going to blow everybody's mind by not having an obvious person as my first guest. I had Michael Bolden of the Tenth Amendment Center as my first guest. Because I wanted to know how did you start from nothing, a guy in his apartment, to now having this tremendous Tenth Amendment Center with 100,000 likes on Facebook, now way more even than that. 
and having state chapters all over the country. And the New York Times calls you, wants your comment on things. Or when you post something on your Facebook page, you drive the news cycle. Suddenly you see it reported in the Washington Post where, how did you do that? That's incredible to me on a shoestring budget. And a shoestring budget is actually overstating it. Like Bolden's one luxury is like he has some kale juice once in a while. <laughs> he does this on nothing. Meanwhile, these think tanks in Washington, the presidents of them get high six-figure salaries. They're riding around in limous limousines. If Michael just had the limousine budget of one of those, imagine what he could accomplish. He's an extraordinary guy. I was so glad to be able to have him on. The other thing I'm doing, and this is also a fundraiser for the North Carolina 10th Amendment Center. Uh, some of you know about this, but I'm going to tell you about it. I got a little discouraged after a while when I realized that simply writing books was not making the college professors change their minds about U.S. history. Okay? And it's, it's disillusioning, right? It, they didn't immediately read them and start teaching different things. So I thought, rather than gripe about this, I'm going to take matters in my own hands and fix it the best way I can. So I start. I start up my own courses in U.S. history. Like I can't fix their brains, but I can teach my own stuff. Like, instead of being a lazy bum who just gripes all day, who wants to be around somebody like that? I, I designed with Kevin Goodsman and some other people that I trust. We've come up with courses in U.S. history, Western civilization, and by the way, we actually like Western civilization on our website and <laughs> economics, like real economics. We have a course on why Keynesianism is all full of it and all that. We've got eight courses up there, plus question and answer forums. And, you know, so there's something we didn't answer, you can go and get it answered. So we've got eight courses, you can listen to them in your car, you don't have to make extra time for them. And it's stuff that you, you should have been taught in school, but none of us were. We all had to learn on our own. I'm trying to minimize the amount of time necessary for you to learn that stuff. So what I've done is this, i got flyers for this out on my, uh, on my table. The site is libertyclassroom.com, libertyclassroom.com. And here's the deal I'm making for you guys where I, so I can, I'm gonna raise a little dough for the 10th Amendment Center. I'm giving you guys a half off coupon code. It lasts for a very, very short amount of time. And after that time is over, I'm going to pretend I never made this offer. You're all crazy lunatics, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm giving a 50% off coupon code. The coupon code in all caps is CAROLINA, in all caps. You enter that in, and you get 50% off, and for everybody who joins in the next couple of days with a coupon code CAROLINA, I'm gonna donate $10 for each person to the 10th Amendment Center of North Carolina. So, <laughs> now, what you guys do? You think, all right, yeah, okay, we heard some great talks, and I'm really persuaded, what can we do? Well, first, join one of these groups that you learned about today, or join the 10th Amendment Center. Go to 10thamendmentcenter.com and join it, and you'll be part of something that is really quite extraordinary. And then, of course, learn everything you can. We're always learning things, and as I say, I'm trying to make it so you can learn while you, because we're all busy enough as it is. I don't want to say to you, hey, read 10 more books this month. Like, where are you going to find the time? I'm trying to produce stuff, my, my show and my site, so you can learn while you're driving along. But learn the stuff so that when people listen to you, they'll say, wow, this person knows what's going on. This person knows this stuff. Because we are a minority. We're very much a minority. We can't afford just to listen to nice speeches and then go home. We have to be knowledgeable. We have to have the impact of two or three people. And we can do that by, well, the tools we have with the internet. I mean, I make videos all the time and I reach a lot of people that way. And it's all for free. Look for ways that you can find a niche where you can make your contribution. But at the very least, join the 10th Amendment Center and be a part of that. But my view is that we've actually already made history. Because historians in the future will look back at the major newspapers of our day and they'll say, isn't that funny? All of a sudden, people were talking about state nullification again. And, and we did that with no media support. To the contrary, the media is, is either attacking us or smearing us or using arguments against us that, have, that were exploded a million times. We have no big right-wing or conservative radio people behind us, except Mike. There's really nobody, I mean, I guess Jerry Doyle would be an example, but really nobody, there's nobody who supports us on this. Nobody will even mention it, not even the word. Walter Williams mentions it when he fills in on uh, Rush Limbaugh, but not a, word from, not, not a word from these people. And yet, for some reason, we are such a threat that the New York Times feels it necessary to attack us, and the Washington Post, and MSNBC, and all these outlets. Something is happening here. 
And now we know from polls that 52% of Americans b believe in the principle, even though what they've heard about it is all, this is for slavery. <laughs> and somehow they know that's BS. Right? They, they're politically astute enough to know anytime somebody says, you support slavery, this is nonsense. Right? They, they have an IQ above 50. You know, so they can see through that. And meanwhile, the other side changes the rules all the time. There's a Yale professor from years ago, Bruce Ackerman. And you would say, Bruce... How can you possibly say that such and such federal program is constitutional? There's no authorization for that in the Constitution. He would say, you're right. But in U.S. history, we have constitutional moments. We have a moment where we all kind of agree that government needs to do more things. So we all kind of implicitly say to each other, you ready? Go. Let's just let them do it. So he'll say, like, the New Deal was one of those times. You know, forget the Constitution. Just do what you think you got to do. And he says, and that's just as good as an amendment. <laughs> but even Alexander Hamilton said in the Federalist that until the people have solemnly, through the mechanism in the Constitution, changed that Constitution, the presumption is that the original meaning is in effect. So, but they do this all the time. All of a sudden we discover that this is constitutional, and that is, and this, this is a constitutional right all of a sudden. All, this changes all the time. If they can change things, why can't we? Why can't we make things happen differently? So we have a moral duty to do this. We have a constitutional mandate to do it. And we can be part of something that, yes, in the short run, will get you called names. That's right. If you are too thin-skinned to endure being called names by thought controllers, like people at Think Progress, who thought, oh, you're all about slavery. These are people, by the way, they're supposed to be on the left. Ha ha, right? They're basically just cronies for the... The, the plutocrats, all these alleged progressives of think progress, they're all for the bailouts, they're all for the same crummy policies of Obama. Uh, these, these people are supposed to be leftists who believe small is beautiful, and yet, for some reason, they don't think 310 million people being governed by one city is maybe out of scale. <laughs> no, they're going to call you names. Think progress, media matters, you know, or think Soros, I think is what we sometimes call it, because George Soros is then get out of this thing right now. But you'll be able to tell your kids someday that you were part of this, because what's going on right now is going to be remembered. We're already having, here and there, we're seeing cracks in the structure. We're making progress with no outside help. Eventually, we're going to get to a point that the big names are going to want to jump on this particular bandwagon. And they're going to claim they were driving all along. And you know what? I don't even care. If it gets the message out there, the more the merrier. But I couldn't be happier and more privileged to be involved in this great cause with all you self-sacrificing patriots in this room. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, that is our episode for today. Check out Nullification over at uh, tomwoods.com on my books page, tomwoods.com slash books. You can get more information about it. Or on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1854. You can just go buy it. And I'm telling you, you're going to like that book. You are going to I am very, very proud of that book. So that is another week of episodes of The Tom Woods Show. And if you are feeling kind of a little isolated and you feel like you're the oddball, you're the odd person out because for some reason after a year of insanity, your friends still believe in insanity when it comes to COVID, well, you are going to find some very nice camaraderie in the Tom Woods Show elite. And entry into that wonderful group is through supportinglisteners.com. Go check that out and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.